Good. Hello and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. I'm Jed Hearn, author of The Thunder Heist, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, starting with Rob. Ah, me. Okay. Uh, I'm Rob Hayes. Uh, I'll be the author of From Cold Ashes Risen, because it's the closest book of mine I have on hand. And uh, yeah, there you go. Dirk. I'm Dirk Ashton, and I wrote the Paternus series. This is Peter. Well, Dirk's holding up a little clay. Is it a clay model or like a three D printed? No, it's one of those. Uh, what's that site you can go and? Oh, Hero Forge. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, Hero Forge. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's like a little resin model. It's a little little Hero Forge. Yeah, the color printed ones. That's pretty sick. Uh, Michael. Thanks. Hi, I'm Michael Larry Fletcher, author of Beyond Redemption, but I, none of my books are in reach, so <laughs> you don't get to look at them. <laughs> And we are joined by a very special guest, Brian Stavely. Brian, welcome to the show. Hi, folks. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm Brian Stavely. My first book was The Emperor's Blades. My most recent book is The Empire's Ruin, which came out just this month. I see that. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> You're all much better prepared than I am. I see you've got Skull Sworn right behind you there, Michael. Absolutely. Tor gave this one to me because uh, I entered a competition and they were like, oh, do you want a copy? I was like, yeah, go on then. Yeah. Oh, Lord, I've already bought it on audio, but I'll happily have a hardback as well. Oh, uh, yeah. That book is as well. huge. It's it mon- yeah, monstrous. Good Lord. And how, many, how many words? Uh, 305. 305,000. That's a big book. Jeez. 735 pages. I keep saying I should write shorter books. We actually thought about breaking it into two, but there's no good way to do it. I was, I was so excited when I thought we might do that. I was like, yes, please. I can have two books for the price of one. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or better yet, two books for the price of two for all the people buying. Them. <laughs> um, but there was, no, there was no real way to do it. You know, it would have been like a weird dopey break right in the middle. So yeah, yeah 305. I think that's like three novels for me. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah that's i think skull sworn is just over 100 um wow. it's like 100 or something so yeah it's big it's big i, I regret it but <laughs> that's that's how it is i mean in the u.s edition is actually much slimmer it's more svelte than that one um i don't know how they put printed it on like you know microscopically thin paper but the uk one they just leaned into it and they're like fuck it let's make a big damn book so there it is all right nice yeah, cool. Um, and today's episode, we're going to be talking about cities as characters. And uh, the reason why I wanted to kind of bring up this episode topic is because Brian had a very interesting article on tour.com recently where he was discussing this topic. Um, and just to kind of kick things off, I'm going to give a quote that was by you, Brian. If there's anything wrong with this quote, feel free to correct me on it. Um, um, it sounds good. It was by me. And if it doesn't sound good, I <laughs> love that disclaimer. Um, that is very clever. So basically, you were talking about how a meticulously observed and lovingly rendered city where you smell every whiff of pepper and hot grease seeping out from behind alley doorways, your heels skids in the vomit slopped up against the wall beside the tavern, you hear the kids three stories up drumming on the fire escape with pilfered kitchen knives, makes any story richer and more immersive. That doesn't mean the city is a character. A city only becomes a character, at least in my mind, when it develops goals, emotions, neuroses, when the emergent property of so many people living together becomes something unpredictable, larger than the sum of the constituent parts. Just wondering if you could, first of all, I absolutely love that quote because I think for me as well, like I always kind of approach the idea of City as a character as just about making it really immersive and giving lots of details. But what you wonderfully point out here is that makes it your story better, absolutely. But it's not enough to actually make the city a character. So do you want to just talk a little bit to that idea? Yeah, I mean, I think... uh... The, the, the key thought there is the, this emergent quality, you know, so you can take a bunch of neurons, right? And you would never guess that if you put together, a, you know, a few billion neurons, you'd get something like human consciousness. Nothing in the individual neuron suggests um, this emergent quality of consciousness that happens later. And, there, you know, there's lots of systems like that that have these emergent qualities that are um, not contained within the elements themselves. And I, I think that social groups can be like that. I mean, this, this stuff like this happens on Twitter in good and bad ways. Um, you know, religions, cults, mobs, all of this stuff, you, you take all these individual people um, and they're gonna behave in a certain way, but then you smush them all together and you get something bizarre and unexpected that's gonna 
feed back into those people uh, and make them do something different. And so writing, you know, especially writing Dombang, which is a city that was in Skullsworn, but is also in the Empire's Ruin. It's, it's a city, it's isolated, it's out in the Delta. Um, so it's very hard to get in or out of it you know, if they don't want you to come in or out on the channels, it's surrounded by, you know, deadly Delta creatures like crocodiles and spiders and poisonous snakes and all kinds of horrible shit. So there's something like insular and claustrophobic about it that leads to um, some bizarre religions and, um, and cults that uh, feed on themselves and are, are hard for the characters to escape. So that you, if you took these people, these characters and you put them in a different place, um, a place with like roads that actually go out somewhere that they can come and go from, they would probably behave quite differently, but because they're stuck in this spot, it, it comes back and it warps them, it warps their behavior. So that's what, at least that was the goal. God knows if it worked. Um, yeah, that's an interesting idea about it. the, um, <laughs> that's an interesting point about like how the geography is really critical and maybe even an essential component to making cities as characters. Cause I, I wrote down a list of some cities that <laughs> for me, are uh, very characterized in fantasy stories. And what I've got here is Kamor from the Lies of Loch Lamora, Gurdon from the Gutter Prayer, and then Roshan, the flying city of a god in The Lessons Never Learned by our very own Rob J. Hayes here. And that's right, Rob, it's you. The spotlight's on you. Um, so I'll get you to talk about it in a second. But in the case of all of those cities, uh, and in Dombang as well, like they are, in, like three of them are like canal cities, um, and they are all sort of, isolated and that leads to yeah a certain sense of us and them like the people within the city have a lot of these external enemies and also it yeah it feels like an environment that is difficult to escape from um mm -hmm. in a way that cities that are just well connected to a bunch of other places you're like why don't the characters just leave um yes. when they yeah, are, yeah. <laughs> when they are trapped I, mean, I, used to, I, I was a high school teacher for a long time and i used to teach um all kinds of world history. Mm. And students would always say, you know, when, when some horrible fucking thing was happening in one place or another, like Viking raids or Mongol attacks or, or a plague, they would be like, well, why, why didn't these people just go somewhere else, yeah. right? And, and, and it, it takes a real leap of empathy and imagination in our modern world to, to say like, well, none of these people had, almost none of them had maps or reliable maps. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't even know what the somewhere else to go was you know that the, the conception that there were different places was there obviously um but it wasn't like what we can do which just get out your your apple maps or your gazetteer and, and get in a car it, it was a, an absolutely major upheaval and that of course was crucial to the way that many many historical events played out if, you, if everybody could have just left when things got <laughs> I mean, sometimes people did, you know, you have mass migrations um, and exoduses of all sorts all in, in global history, but most of the time people did not. They just, there's a famine, there is a plague, there is an invasion and they stay. And that being forced to stay is like the, the thing in the horror movie where everybody's at the cabin in the woods, but you know, the road is washed out. That's like the way yeah. it was for almost all human history for almost everybody <laughs> metaphorically, right? They're in some cabin in the woods and the road was washed out. And, and the that, phones are dead. And the phones are dead and, and yeah, yeah. I mean, who, who are you going to call when the mongols are invading and there's, there's no phones um and you know that's what creates i think a, a lot of the tension a lot of the pressure that you know those of us who are writing stories about this kind of thing can exploit but i'm, I'm curious to hear about rob rob's handling of his city yeah talk us um, <laughs> I, don't know, I mean for for the for roshan in uh in the lesson of well, the war return it's in two of the books it's already books, yeah. um I, I, I literally wanted to make the city living. So, I mean, it's it's already, I already set it on this giant flying upturned mountain. It's like if you take a mountain and just chop it off at the base, then turn it upside down and it flies. Uh, and then a massive city on it. And I, I thought, you know, I'm, I want to actually make the city alive because it's a city of the the Rand who are the who are the, the gods who are very focused on on life, on on things that are alive, all their magic is to do with life. So I literally decided I, I'll make the city uh the bones of a monster so there's like there's i'd try there's a monster sleeping at the heart of this city at the heart of this mountain and all of the buildings are literally formed out of its bones which sort of grow upwards out of it um i'm totally and it's to the ground that. as well no 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 it's it's that's like that's, that's doshan <laughs> uh, oh, wait, doshan's, doshan's 
Roshan oh, right. the flying city Roshan. that's flying around. Doshan that's is right. the one that's trapped on the ground. Yes. Uh, that has another monster sleeping inside of it, but <laughs> that monster, <laughs> that monster's body is literally the chains that secure the city to the ground. Yes. Um, I have cooler ideas. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, yeah. This the lessons never learned is like one of my favorite books of all time, and like that the world building of that city is just so cool. Because yeah, it's it's again like it's taking that idea of being trapped in a city to an extreme. Like there's literally no way the characters can get off it. Yeah, the majority of the populace are they 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 may have gone there willingly, but there is no way down. Because yeah. like the only ways down are, are like these the these, uh, flying machines, like you know almost like little helicopter type things. But they're uh, they're very much controlled by the 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 god in charge of the city. Mm -hmm. um so the majority of people they have no way down they are literally that's it they're they're on the it's city like flying united there. somewhere you know you just there is a way <laughs> you can get on the plane but it's united so you can't yeah. <laughs> impossible to escape <laughs> you could always just jump off the side i suppose yeah uh, I'll, i've thought about it on some of those fights <laughs> so how, how does that impact so you know how does that impact the, the plot or the characters who are there and, and how, you know, that claustrophobia, that stuckness, how does that play out? Um, well, the, for the main character, it, it, in some ways it doesn't so much as uh, she, she's, well, she's trapped there for a different reason. There's people hunting her and oh, all sorts. Um, but, <laughs> uh, it, it's more just, I, I wanted to get a, a sort of a general feel of, it's a very insular city. It's, it's kind of, yeah almost metropolitan there are different races but they're all they're, they're they're all there there's no sort of like police force because there doesn't need to be there's there's not really any crime because it's this idea that the if anybody steals you know like everybody would know who it is because uh -huh. the city well it's a big oh, oh no, it was, oh, no. we it's, lost rob he's there already. we lost rob oh and it's rob by just, taken again Oh, Rob, oh, cast, like, you cut out for about I, I 10 seconds. I cast a breathe spell on him. <laughs> <laughs> you're back. Nat 20 yeah, yeah, you're, you're back. back. You're back, Rob. Yeah. You're back. I've released the spell. I can't be having internet issues. Oh, good. Yeah. You're okay um, you were now. Just saying about the dog has just chewed through the internet cable. Who knows? <laughs> well, now, Michael, you've got that the, the city with all the circles in the, yes. um, city the obsidian. Is that the obsidian path? Yep. series what it's called yeah what, or the other one but yeah city of sacrifice yeah the yeah. the aztec sort of influenced one yeah yeah i mean for me I, I was very much trying to uh to write uh those books as like the city is kind of one of the characters in a way like in that it um it influences everything that happens like, yeah it, it, yeah it, because of the sort of defined rings and the cast system mm -hmm. um like i have no idea if it works but it's kind of like the idea of I think if you if you took the same story and then dumped it in a different city, you'd have this completely different story. Um, it's hard to even imagine that story in a different city because, like you said, it's inextricably yeah. tied to the cast system. Yeah, it, exactly. System. It's like it it kind of you're right. Like it, it couldn't really happen anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, like even just you know if you had the same cast system but no walls. Yeah. Um, you know, it, even then, it's still like this this different story. Yeah. Um, and then part of it, um, you know, for me was, was really getting into how it, how it felt being in there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just trying to, you know, get the age across of, of everything sort of really sit the reader in the, you know, like the smell of the foods and seeing the, you know, the worn corners on the stone and, and that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, sort of immersing, uh, the character more in uh, the reader more in the city than than I would have say for another book where it's kind of like they're in a city they're going to a pub you yeah, know, yeah yeah you, you don't right, need right. every you don't need to feel every detail mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I think if you're doing if you're aiming for like city as a character yeah there, there's a little you need to bring the reader in a little bit more yeah than oh just, yeah you know they're yeah. at a pub well, and I think as you delve into those details and create them and start thinking back through like the, the eras of the city's history and the politics and the way that that is informing the food and all this stuff, I find that there's, there's stuff that I didn't expect in my plot that needs to happen because of stuff that is true about the city. Um, you know, once you start, um, you know, just thinking about the basics of how goods and services move around a city, you're like, oh gosh, that 
actually needs to be in the book. It needs to, it's relevant to my characters. Um, and so I find it sort of, sort of a burden, but in, and a possibility as well. Yeah. Yeah. De definitely catching details like that. You know, when you sort of finished your first draft and going, how the fuck do they get the food from that one area to that other yeah. area? And like, oh shit, yeah. that's actually important. Like, you yeah, know, it's going to inform the characters and their choices and stuff. And I was yeah, trying to think of sure. an example, but like in Don Bang, I was like, well, what are, what are their funerary customs? What do they do with their dead? Mm. Um, they can't really bury them <laughs> because there's not enough, you know, that's a canal city built on a swamp. Yeah. Um, so, you know, cremation was, was the obvious answer. But there's actually a whole, um, there's a whole chapter of my book that takes place kind of near and around the crematorium um, that I, I, it, it's part of the plot, you know, it's necessary to the plot. Um, but it, it only happened because first I just had to have this whole mental, you know, tour of the city and understand how, how they bury their dead. And then I was like, oh, there's a crematorium. Well, where are they gonna put that? They're not gonna put it right in the middle of the city. It's gonna be on the edge of the city. Who's gonna live around it? And then suddenly that's feeding back into the story and back into the characters themselves. Yeah. What yeah. other kind of they, questions are you asking yourself like that? Because that's a very like that's a very logistical thing, right? Is is that the kind of thing that you're considering when you're developing these cities? Is all it kinds of, yeah. I no, no oh, I've no. frozen, Brian. <laughs> Dirk, stop using okay. a freeze. That one's not me then. <laughs> unfreeze. His unfreeze. accuracy is a little bit off tonight. Unfreeze. Uh, my magic is my magic is poor today. Um, we'll give it a few more seconds for Brian to come back. Unfreeze. <laughs> I feel like he was about to say something really smart. Dirk, do you sure. want to talk a little bit um, while we're waiting for Brian? Oh, he's back. There you go. Oh, back. You're back. Okay, sorry, Brian. Frozen. Just cut out for about 20 seconds or so. Oh, 20 seconds. Gosh. Um, so in uh, in Dombang, did, did you hear all the stuff about the timber? They need no, to get no. the timber. Yeah, it was literally, as soon as I asked the question, you said like oh. three words and then it stopped. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it was all brilliant. Everything I said was just... Damn it. <laughs> um, <That's> <laughs> so... <laughs> So the city has, you know, it's it's a marsh. There's no there's no trees to speak of, but they need to build things. They need to build bridges, boats, buildings. Um, and so, you know, I was thinking, well, where does the lumber come from? They harvest it about 100, 200 miles up, up river and they float the, the lumber down. They have these big log drives. Um, and, you know, that, that was just, I, I have to think about that when I was thinking about where the lumber comes from. And then in the Empire's Ruin, there's a there, there's just three kind of minor characters, but who play an important part earlier in the book, who are log drivers. You know, that's that's their profession, and you know it's a super dangerous profession because people are always getting crushed. You know, this is down, you know, from Maine or you know wherever Canada, they would just float it, and and people would you know, run along the logs breaking up log jams which was incredibly dangerous because if Jeez. you slipped between the logs you're going to be crushed and drowned right yeah and so you know life expectancy for these folks in the book is 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 low and they're all kind of maimed and bitter and a little bit broken they do this for not much money and so then you know that feeds back into the plot of well like so they're pissed at this one character of mine because he basically doesn't have to do this with his life he's a priest he's, he has a comfy life and so they hate him um <laughs> So, but you know, but that again, that originated just from me thinking like, oh my God, they've got all these buildings, but there's no, there's no trees here. Where the fuck did the buildings come from? So, you know, then I go into log drives and who's doing the log drives and has that fit politically and socially. And, and then, then we're back into the, into the story again. So yeah, a lot of it does start out really nuts and boltsy. Like where do they bury their dead or what do they do with their dead? Where do, where do the resources come from to build these buildings? Um, you know, do they have, Dombang is like a very sort of equatorial city. Do they have anything cold there? Like, is there such a thing as cold drinks? Mm. Um, well, there is, but then that implies a whole ice trade for people who are, you know, running massive bl blocks of ice down on ships from the north. So it's like, and then you've got that whole thing that you can deal with or not if you want to. But, but most of the stuff begins with me just trying to figure out some prosaic little question of, like is is there stone here where's the stone you know shit like that yeah did you uh because i mean you, you actually you had the sort of ice drinks in uh skull swarm mm -hmm. um did, did you already have sort of like the answer to the icing or, or yes like was there a lot of sort of inventing as you were going and then you were like 
then you have to go and problem solve where you're like, hang on, I've just had like ice added into this. Where are yeah. they going to get this? I guess, yeah, I no, I guess it's more the second thing you said. Yeah, I'll, I'll start to write something or even if it's just a metaphor. I think that they, I got into the ice thing because I wanted to use ice as a metaphor um, for one of my character, for my character. And I was like, oh, wait, they don't know what ice is probably. Um, so then I was like, I really want to use this metaphor. It wasn't even like a, 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 a specific fact of the book, but I was like, it's the right, it's the right metaphor. So now I've got to get away for, for the character to be familiar with ice. So create an I entire think, logistic system just so you can use yes, that metaphor. I, I love that. that metaphor, but I was determined to use it. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of me getting myself into corners and being like, oh man, how do I get out of this? corner <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of inventiveness and that's like why i think fantasy stories are, are awesome um we've probably got about like five minutes before we want to start wrapping this question up and we've we've talked a lot about sort of the idea of like why does this city make this story unique or how can i make this city unique to make it feel like a character but i think there's another aspect to cities as characters which is what does this city what is it trying to make your characters do or what's the pressure that it's putting on your characters so in, for instance, a place like uh, Kamor from the Lies of Loch Kamora, it's all about this city is kind of putting this pressure on people to thieve and steal from each other. Um, in mm. yeah, a place like Gurdon from the Gutter Prayer, the city is putting this pressure on all the different factions in there to kind of politically outmaneuver each other and to try to gain power in there. So how do you kind of think about that in terms of what do you think about that in terms of that question? Like, what is this city trying to make my characters do do you kind of think about that differently what's your what's your thoughts well i think it's more it's more considering what are the um tensions within the city itself so if if, if you, the story of your city is it was founded by you know joey the great and it's been run by joey the great's descendants who are benevolent and wise for the last five generations that's not very interesting hmm. um everybody likes them and they get along but so in in dombang you know it's a it was independent for a long time, but it was taken over by the empire. And so you have people who believe in the empire and the values, the sort of more progressive values of the empire in a way. And then you have people who are like, no, the empire is evil. They took over my city. They killed a whole bunch of people. And I don't care if they're enlightened. I want my city back. And, um, you know, so you, you have these insert this insurgency that's running against this occupation. And so that forces any character human character in the city to, to choose sides um and so because the city itself is is kind of a split personality and so yeah i guess that is um that is one i it's probably not the only but that's one of the main pressures that dom bang brings to bear on the people who live there is it says you come in here and you got to choose your side um got it you know and that, that it's just pitting people against each other even people who want nothing to do with that you don't get to not have anything to do with it it's like if you are patronizing an establishment that's run by an Anurian, you know, the, 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 this imperial presence, you're making a statement about the local population. If you're patronizing a different establishment, you're making a statement about the Anurian presence and there's no way to stay out of it. Um, yeah, that's, that's genius. And actually, I think you're right. That probably is what makes places like Kamor and Gurdon and, and even places like Ankh-Morpork Pork from Discworld. I think that is what makes those cities compelling is the amount of different factions and competing interests in the city that characters are caught between and having to figure out how to maneuver within. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want people to feel comfortable. You don't, you can't have your characters just be comfortable and happy. That's <laughs> never, you have never to happy. To I think Don Barn's an excellent uh, place to do that, seeing as how everything in the city and all of its surroundings are just trying to kill everyone all the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's what, uh, yes. <laughs> Basically Australia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the uh, treating a, a city as a character, I mean, a lot of times too, the things that, that, that I really like are um, when the city itself either literally or figuratively has uh, a, a palpable feel to it. Like, I mean, even we talk about uh, some cities, you, you go there and you feel energized all the time, you know, or you feel po a positive, um, uh, mm -hmm. effect or some cities you go and you just feel oppressed so it's you know it's almost like you know you can give them the characteristic of you know uh you know a being uh or, or a god or whatever that um a force of nature that 
that is pro-life and pro-people, you know? So, you know, you can talk about somebody running down the street and a very important thing is happening in the book and it feels like the, it feels like all the roads are, are going down and, and pushing them and, and, and the buildings are, you know, you can almost hear the encouragement. You on. Mm. Um, whereas, no, other, no. Uh, whereas other cities could be like an energy vampire, you know, they're just mm-hmm. sucking the energy. Well, I think that's called Brampton, time. Ontario. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then there, you know, you can even have, um, you know, there, there, there are books where I'll read in it, you know, and there are more literal, you know, where literally buildings can, you know, poles yeah. and buildings can fall down in front of you. Yeah. And try to crush you, right? Or move out of your way. Um, there are a lot of ways to give a city without literally going, you can literally go with that kind of stuff. And I always love that stuff. But, yeah, uh, yeah. But you, can, um, you can figuratively give uh, a city character traits or, or, uh, or mm. real, real palpable mm-hmm. emotion um, that, that affects the characters and the story. Yeah, absolutely. I studied architecture. Or you can literally go the uh, the Gareth Hangahan route and just have the city as a literal character that you have a <laughs> yeah. perspective, a perspective yeah. dedicated to like yeah. the city. Yeah, the opening gonna... chapter for the God of Prayer is literally from the perspective of like a church. So yeah, I think this is yeah. the perfect example for this. Um, yeah. Dirk, the term for that I think you're you're sort of talking about here is one of the things that we learned when I was studying architecture, which is genus loci, I believe it's pronounced, which is like the spirit of a place. So mm-hmm. that can refer to like there's was like literally a belief that certain places had a spirit that was sort of possessing or guiding them, like in the case of, of the gutter prayer, or it can just refer to what you're talking about with what is the overall tone or emotion of this place. So that's an interesting yeah. thing to consider. And even if you don't come out straight away and say, hey, this city is energetic and enthusiastic, just knowing that that's what you're shooting for will allow you to, you know, put the details in that build towards that. And that's probably sure. better than yeah. actually saying it on the nose. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I think this is a good place to wrap up this episode. Uh, Brian, before we wrap up, do you want to tell us a little bit about your latest book? Uh, it's called The Empire's Ruin. It's the beginning of a new trilogy uh, that takes place. Thanks, Rob. Um, that takes place in the same world as my previous books. Um, it's a monster. It follows three different characters, three different POV characters. One is uh, a Keptral, so a special forces soldier who's been disgraced and sent on a mission to the other side of the world. Um, one is a priest of the God of love who is struggling with his devotion because he has a very dark past. And one is a sort of monk who's decided to use his monastic skills to become a con man. And those three plot lines kind of gradually come together. So yeah, check it out. People are always asking me, do you need to read the other books first? And um, everybody who has started with The Empire's Ruin says no. They say, no, it's a great first book. But everybody who's read the other books says, what the hell's wrong with them? Of course you need to read the other books first. So win, win. Beats the shit out of me. Uh, I think you can do it. I'm, I'm literally at the point where you've just introduced the second point of view character and the moment like his, like his name was mentioned, I was just like, wait a minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think you, you will get more out of it if you read the other books first, but evidently it reads fine for people who are first time, you know, new, new, new to me, new to the world. Awesome. All right. That is The Empire's Ruin. Uh, so go check that out. Also, a big thank you to our patrons for sponsoring the show. Uh, if you would like to help support the show, go to wizardswarriorswords.com forward slash patrons. Uh, and there you can find various options for supporting the show and also getting cool bonuses like free advanced reader copies from us, um, editorial feedback and add free access to episodes. Thank you also to our high tier patron, Daniel Henderson. Uh, and Brian, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you oh, everybody awesome. for listening yeah, and watching. Great. See you, everybody. Great.